Okay. Uh, Ruth Ford, you almost think again. <laughs> Yep. How do you do this? Yep. Okay. Do you want to extend this? Uh, you can either or whichever you sure. prefer. Mm. Where have you? Which faculty are you with? Ruth? Humanities and Cultural Science. Okay. Um, which one is you? Oh, this one? Yeah. <laughs> So those keys toggle between the two, but before we do that, I'll just uh, screen share. Okay. Next media assessment for student learning and community engagement. <laughs> Whoops, the title of the presentation is on the screen. Uh, for those squinting up the back, uh, <laughs> that's Mixed Media Assessment for Student Learning and Community Engagement, Ruth Ford from Humanities and Social Sciences. Thanks, Lee. Um, so I teach history at La Trobe University's Bendigo and Shepparton campuses. And with um, Sue Gilbert at the Aubrey Wodonga campus, I teach a second year core history subject, and it's called Community History, Creating Stories of People and Place. It was taught for the first time at Aubrey Wodonga, Bendigo, Mildura and Shepparton in 2012. Um, we redesigned the subject which had previously been taught by Sue, um, transforming the assessment and the learning activities. So it had previously been an um, a essay based subject um, and we transformed it to an inquiry based learning subject with a community history output on display to the public in Victorian History Week. Um, which is conveniently held in week 12 or 13 of semester every year, um, and also with an, an ongoing digital presence of their projects. And having said that, I don't know how to use the technology to go oh, to the... That's good. There, next. Okay. Um, and that's just the flyer from the um, community for the launch of the project. Is it? Just have it. Oh, it's just... Okay. Um, and that's just for a different campus. So through our own experiences in teaching other inquiry-based learning subjects, we knew that the opportunity to do research around a project of their own choice was popular with students, focusing on their own communities and allowing them to choose and design their own projects would allow students to actively construct new knowledge about the community while feeling they were part of both the learning community and the community they were studying. Um, and students selected really diverse thematic topics mostly located in the geographical communities that they lived in, which I thought was interesting given the, the Facebook generation. For example, Shepherd and students' topics included histories of um, the local Namurka hospital, civilian internment during World War II, at, um, Marupna, indigenous white race relations, Italian prisoner of war um, at Murchison, a local bridge, mining. Um, at Bendigo, we of course had gold mining. <laughs> Um, lives of Chinese people on the gold field, a local Aboriginal mission, the prison, um, brothels in the 19th century, pubs, bush rangers, Freemasons, bushfires, local industries, mechanics institutes and architecture. Oh, sorry, I'm okay. Um, and Aubrey Wodonga topics included um, the Rubber Glen wine industry, Chinese gold miners and a Myrtleford prisoner of war camp. Um, it's only week one of semester, but um, I'm not sure what the students will pull out of the bag this year, but I was really excited that within two hours of the first class, I'd already got students who decided their topic. So we've got a local history of a local brass brand, the um, origins of a Muslim um, mosque at Shepparton, a local theatre, a church, a dairy farm. And so I think that's indicating that their engagement in studying something that's part of their lives and communities is important to them. Um, and obviously the diverse topics show the students different interests um, and the, the really diverse communities that they're part of in their lives outside of La Trobe. Um, and what we did find last year that students that might have put in little um, effort <laughs> into a set topic that they weren't interested in did become engaged and actively researched the topic they'd selected. So one student who was doing family history of a prisoner of war was so motivated by his 
research findings of these really powerful personal letters in a government archive that his parents and um, uncles and aunts had never seen, that he really extended himself beyond his previous, um, you know, fairly low level engagement to interpret his research and tell a really powerful story. The conceptual thread that linked these really diverse topics was community. So what might the research say about their community's identities, their aspirations, about power relations within communities in relation to class, ethnicity, um, gender and age, about silence voices, about inclusion and exclusion. And that was kind of the common thread despite the diversity within their projects. We stressed to them that the research on their local communities was really important. Many of the topics hadn't been researched before and they were telling stories that hadn't been told before, effectively providing new community histories, adding new stories to older local histories which were often in rural regional Victoria, a history of you know, the first white baby, white settler success with conflict and diversity erased. We emphasised that we were learning and critiquing um, the kind of the problems and pitfalls and potentials of community history not just by reading about it and critiquing others' practice, but by casting them in the role of the student historian creating history. Um, some students ad adopted that role of researching and telling untold stories with gusto, and one student kind of passionately declared after visiting a local museum how important he, he felt that all his fellow students' projects were to new histories being told in their communities. Other students developed a real passion for research, including travelling to Melbourne to spend hours in the public records office going through police records of, um, of um, prostitutes um, working in Uchuka in the 19th century. You know, in, in something, and she admitted it was the first time she'd never used the library and she was in third year. So this was her first <laughs> experience of research. Um, a really key focus of the assessment was that they had to produce a community history project um, that would be on display in Victorian History Week. Um, they could select one of five output formats that were common in community history and that was a display or mini exhibition with objects, a heritage tour brochure either in print or in podcast form, um, a web exhibition or an illustrated magazine style article. We modelled these formats through, through showing examples in class having links to really diverse community histories on LMS and also having um, video interviews with public historians and heritage professionals about interpretive and practical um, issues on those different formats. We used tutorial time for students to give feedback to each other on work in progress. Um, no, that'll be that'll that link open itself or do I need to? Uh, no, but okay. No, oh, thanks. <laughs> um, to give working, um, to give feedback on work in progress projects. Now, while the real world deadline um, created pressure and nervousness for many students, for others it did generate um, a focus and excitement, and and um, and they they all except for one student did meet the deadline, which is unheard of in humanities and social sciences, <laughs> <laughs> unlike health. <laughs> um, so many students embraced the opportunity to convey their historical research. Um, it's not going to... No. Here we go. Oh, here we go. Um, to convey their historical research, interpretation and narrative in a non-essay form. And obviously, you know, a lot of you are here from health, but in the humanities, the second and third year students that were doing this subject had already written essays or exams totaling about 45 to 75,000 words. And a, an arts graduate, um, can potentially write 90,000 words of essays and exams by the time they complete their degree. So it's not surprising that um, many students were excited about working in different media. So in week two, 67% um, uh, of students chose to work in an alternative media, so 30% doing a display or an exhibition, 20% um, doing a heritage tour and 17% doing a web exhibition. Um, and about a third of the students opted for the kind of illustrated magazine style article, which was the closest thing um, to an essay. Um, nobody, um, a couple of people thought they were going to do podcasts, but they didn't. Um, and they were given the option to work in groups or um, pairs or solo, and probably about 85% of students um, chose to do solo projects, which I think is partly um, 
their own particular passionate interests that they wanted to do, as well as the fact that just juggling um, multiple work, family, children, that they just found that group juggling too difficult. Uh, their projects being in public meant that we covered copyright law, um, privacy and ethical obligations and stress that they needed to comply, not that they all did. Um, and um, there's obviously issues about that we can talk about. Um, the, the, the expectation of not only um, working to a real world deadline but work to be displayed in public was met by considerable anxiety, I have to say, as well as resistance. So some students did not want their work to be available to the public because they feared that the low standard would affect future job opportunities. For example, education students who would be applying for teaching jobs feared that um, if they went for a job their work could be Googled. So the compromise that we reached was that digital projects could be anonymous if they wanted them to be and that no projects which failed or got a D grade would be displayed digitally for you know, eternity. <laughs> um, but as well as student concerns, I have to say that a couple of colleagues thought I was completely crazy. They thought that making public student pr projects that were often done by struggling regional students with um, entry scores in the 50s would affect Latrobe's reputation and my own as a teacher. Um, uh, the issues that have been raised about the sustainability of assessment in terms of staff and student workloads was real for me last year, particularly as we were in the middle of a restructure and I was made redundant at the end of it. <laughs> um, the workload was, was much higher but I think second time around um, this semester I'm hoping it's going to be much cruisier because you know I hadn't done, worked with students on having public websites before and you know just the usual things that happened the night before the opening, a student accidentally erased 60 other students' pages, web pages. <laughs> it could all be reinstated because Mungo and John had given me advice on a good platform to pick, but it still did take time to reinstate it all. Um, the, the students, I have to say, the assessment workload did vary in different media. Um, the web exhibitions were based on a WordPress um, site where students just uploaded headings and images and text. Um, uh, I think that's why students, the podcast was just um, was a bit too much outside their comfort zone for that. Um, although we did work in progress peer feedback, we didn't give an assessment value to that, which is what we're doing this year. So peer feedback um, is now worth 5% um, and so it will be formalised that every student will bring a draft um, to class or online and they'll give written peer feedback to each other. Um, Hopefully um, it's week one, but I'm hoping that we'll have a wiki as an option this semester as well. Um, and of course the wiki would be closed while they're working on it the semester and then open. So it will have a life of its own beyond the um, projects. And I have to say, although we picked a WordPress platform that looks kind of exhibition-y because that's the kind of museum exhibition um, genre we're working in, we the, there is a space obviously for people to make comments but it's not a, it doesn't have that look of a blog, a blog site um, and that's something that we'll probably explore in the future, a different kind of platform which is, has more community um, interaction. Um, although of course other historians that we're working with there's huge problems with spam and the moderation of, of those kind of um, sites. Um, so I'm I'm kind of excited about the, the um, possibilities of students doing inquiry-based learning um, but with the capacity for the results of their research to be embedded in the, commu in the community and to, um, to, you know, to, to, to they in turn will generate new discussions and, and new stories in that community. Um, and certainly when students research a topic or an event of their own interest and develop a narrative or an argument about that which because it's a core, it needs to reflect the standards of evidence and historical context which are part of the qualitative history standards um, and communicate that narrative in an engaging and invocative way um, and sharing it with the public through either a physical display exhibition in a public space or an online digital form is, is kind of exciting. Well, thank you.